What does it mean to curate? What does your creation process look like? Oh, we're just jumping straight into it, right? So yeah, um, curation, it's an interesting field. If you actually kind of take apart the word itself um, to curate, curation, it actually comes from the Latin verb curare, which means to kind of care for, to care for, to look after, to be worried about. Um, being a curator is um, a field that I've been involved in for over 30 years, and it involves just really thinking about um, organizing, identifying, showcasing, um, and being part of a conversation through a visual means. I curate exhibitions primarily, although I've curated music series, um, reading series, but my main focus uh, has been curating visual arts. How different would you say curation is from creation? Do you sort of like draw a line between one's creativity and one's curativity, so to speak? No, I mean, I think uh, good curation is one that is creative in its own ways. It's, it's, a, it's creating the proper, most appropriate platform to allow the art to shine in its best way possible. The artwork is the artwork, but in the context in which it's actually being presented, situated, the other works that the artwork is in conversation with, um, that's kind of the act of curation. I mean, to, to maybe make it sound a little less mysterious, um, I think everyone has a bit of curation in them. For example, if you were to put together your own playlist, you've, you are not the mastermind and creator of each individual song, but the ways that the songs flow into each other and the kind of dynamic and narrative and rhythm that you're creating with the combination of all of these songs to create a playlist for whatever kind of mood you might be in. If it's a playlist for a best friend, if it's a playlist for mom and dad, if it's a playlist for your, your partner and your lover, they all have different meanings and different kind of vibes you in the act of caring for somebody and caring for the placement of this type of music is the act of curation. I really like to play this example. And, um, you know, looking at your website, I saw every single sort of like creative work had a curational statement associated with it. Yeah. And I'm curious if maybe you could explain what a curational, uh, a curatorial statement is, maybe from the perspective of like a playlist. Well, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. A curatorial statement is basically the reasons why these certain works are living together for a certain amount of time at a particular place. For an exhibition, why necessarily are these works in conversation with each other? What's the large idea that these works are actually supporting? To put it in the context of like relating that as an analogy to a playlist, like if you were to, instead of writing a Valentine's letter to your, to your partner or to your lover, you would basically be writing it with this playlist. Instead of like really pouring out your heart through your own words, you'd be doing it through the curation of, of different types of songs with different types of lyrics, right? Yeah. You might preface it by a short note, which would be, I guess, the playlist kind of writing statement about why you decided to send them this particular playlist of really heartfelt songs at a particular moment in time. Maybe it's celebrating a, an anniversary. Maybe it's because um, they just mean that much to you in your life. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm curious what you'd think about this way of looking at exhibitions. And, you know, I feel like as human beings, we're so, we really don't enjoy redundancy, right? So then why is it that we like rituals? Why is it that we have rituals? And I feel like exhibitions are a sort of form of a ritual in which say a curator takes a bunch of artwork, establishes a curatorial statement, and then orients a bunch of pre-created artwork in a way that gives it new life and allows the viewer to have a new way of looking at that artwork. Would you agree with that way of looking at exhibition is maybe your way of looking at exhibition sort of similar to that? I mean, that's a great way to put it because again, each one of those individual artworks in its own context would have a slightly different meaning 
by itself rather than in conversation with a whole grouping of artworks. It's almost like isolating one particular song from a playlist versus it being the kind of go-between song between two other songs. It Everything has meaning dictated by proximity. Everything has meaning or meaning that just gets help kind of be fleshed out through proximity. Mm. And actually, I would disagree with you. I think as humans, as I think we really kind of depend on routine. I think um, a lot of us, when we get knocked out of a certain routine, we kind of feel a little bit discombobulated. We don't feel grounded. We all have different routines, whether it be like you brush your teeth before you wash your face, whether you put on the coffee pot before you put in the toaster, toast in the toaster oven. We all have routines, you know? Yeah. And if we think about the curatorial statement as what's driving the choices being made by the curator, would you say most of the time that's something that can be articulated with words? Or do you sometimes find yourself curating and not being able to articulate what's drawing you towards certain pieces of artwork, but just putting them together anyways? No, I think I think um, smart curation will always have a vocalized articulation of why works are living together. There could be the initial gut instinct towards the gravitation towards a piece of work, but every smart curator will be able to explain to you necessarily why these works are living in proximity to each other. What kind of um, meanings can be teased out by, again, this, this proximity to each other? One of my favorite studio works of yours was uh, A Pack A Day, especially because it got me thinking about ways in which maybe the branding design of products in a way is like a form of public art. And I'm curious, like looking back at your time in Beijing during the early 90s, what do you think inspired you to take this project on? What do you think were the key takeaways you took on from this project? Oh, that's a that's a great analogy, actually. In many ways, um, if you choose to look at it through this altruistic lens of public art, yeah, pretty much all branding advertising is a free form of 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 public visuals, right? Um, of course, the ultimate intent for these uh, designs, for these artworks, for whatever is out there in the world, is is to get you to 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 buy a product or to buy a service. Um, when I was living in China uh, back then, I think it was just the sheer um, the sheer diversity and almost infinite variety of design and coloring and different packaging of these of these cigarette packs that just I, my eye just gravitated towards in terms of the urban landscape. Whenever I would see these storefronts or these little corner um, uh, you know, carts that were selling the cigarettes, I would just see this, this incredible display of, of design and, and color that my eye would just gravitate towards. And it became almost like a, a, a treasure hunt at a certain point where I would just look out for designs that I had not seen before. And it almost got infinite in terms of the amounts of different types of packaging that I was able to, um, to, 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 to get my hands on. Yeah, and a group of words that I saw come up in the description of that project was global homogenization. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I'm curious as a curator, how do you think about this concept of global homogenization? Would you maybe characterize that as something negative or maybe something positive or something a bit more nuanced? And well, global binary? homogenization and also like the monoculturalization of what's happening at the moment. Even though with the advent of the internet, which is only, again, a technology that's not been around for, at the very most, like 30 years. This promise of access to infinite information has actually led to a situation where basically the algorithm is, is, is creating this platform of monoculture for many of us. The way that a lot of us consume information, consume news, and consume culture is through the platform of of the internet and you know social media is being part of the internet and many would argue social media being the predominant form that people engage with on the internet um i think you know the fact that we are much more of a globalized society in 2024 than we were in 1994 is because of the ability to connect and to communicate and to 
to uh, again communicate over 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 so many things that are now that we take for granted in terms of email communications, cellular communications, um, internet communications. Um, I don't think we've fully seen it played out yet, but you know, I think the the increasing proclivity towards like a singular culture, a singular kind of visual aesthetic, a singular, um, and don't get me wrong. I love both of their art forms, but you know, the fact that Beyonce and Taylor Swift, like kind of have almost, a a, a monopoly over anything that is kind of talked about in terms of the music world these days. Right. Yeah. I don't think even if you're not a fan of either Beyonce or Taylor Swift, that you probably know who they are if not at least one or two of their songs, if you're not like a super fan, because of the fact of, of, of social media, the algorithm, the internet. It's interesting to sort of contrast the experience a person visiting China in the early 90s would have versus a person visiting China for the first time now. Or you could actually make that argument about anywhere. A yeah. person visiting Mexico for the first time in 1993 versus 2023, right? Yeah, like every groups of people has their own culture, whether it be musically, architecturally, uh, through their art. And, you know, if I was going to visit China right now, I'd do research. I could get a good idea of what their architecture looks like, music sounds like, maybe what kind of events I'd like to do to sort of live within that culture. But if you were going to visit China in the early 90s, it must have been like going to a whole new world because of your, um, because of the absence of like accessing that kind of information. That must have been much more... Must have been much more striking of an experience, I would imagine. I mean, I think this is what we're we're kind of pointing towards is again just like the flattening of experience, the flattening of culture. In many ways, you could you could say that sometimes this is a good thing, but in many ways, it kind of negates the really uh, the the true beauty of what how diversity should be understood. You have strength in numbers. There's strength in differences. You know. Um, the fact that you can go anywhere in the world these days and maybe go to a coffee shop and it looks like the same coffee shop that you go to here in San Francisco, which is actually playing the same musical soundtrack. You know, in terms of you can go to Peru, you could go to South Korea, you could go to Germany, and it will be the same kind of fancy coffee shop. And, you know, what does that really mean to to have that kind of flattening of of, of experience and, 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 and culture? And, you know, you previously served as a co-chair for the City of Oakland's Public Art Advisory Committee. And it's interesting seeing how this concept plays out in regard to public art. Do you think that maybe the right approach to take to public art is to say we want to preserve the integrity of the local culture and not so much saying what's the most beautiful piece of art we could place here, but rather what's the most, well, what piece of art would reflect the local community the most? Yeah, that's a conversation that many different municipalities have all the time when they're actually um, looking to commission new public artwork for their libraries, for their community centers, for their public plazas, for their new transit centers. You know, many of them actually do have a stipulation that the artists that are chosen, at least uh, a certain percentage of finalists, actually be residents within the community that the public art's going to be placed into. Does that have a guarantee that that artist will then talk about matters that is important to that local community? Not necessarily so, but does the fact matter that that artist has come from that community versus New York or Canada or Mexico or France or England or Korea? You know, I think it it, it, it definitely, you'd want to have that opportunity for artists in your own backyard to be able to produce public art in your own backyard. Yeah. And drawing from that experience working with the city of Oakland, what do you think public art projects done right looks like? If you were to take another one on, um, what would be some of the takeaways from your previous experience you take with you? I mean, I think what public art done right looks like and feels like is one where the community broadly defined really claims a heartfelt ownership over that piece where people feel proud of having that piece in their neighborhoods, where people feel a little bit protective of it. If, for example, if it ever gets tagged upon with graffiti, there will be an immediate kind of uh, collective response to 
to to basically source funding and or labor to be able to clean it up you know a good piece of public art feel makes people feel proud of where they're at makes people feel in my opinion brings a little bit of joy uh just from crossing that public arts pathway in whatever normal daily routine that person's having either going to the bus station to go to work or coming back to the bus station and going home just having that moment where um a little bit of joy can be kind of sparked you know yeah and in the initial stages of that project were there any examples or sort of case studies you looked at of um public art projects in the past that accomplished that goal i mean there are many and there are many public art pieces that were not necessarily um officially commissioned or sanctioned by any kind of municipal agency that have brought that kind of same sensibility. One of my best examples here in San Francisco is uh, Clarion Alley. It's a one block alley in the Mission District between um, Valencia and Mission Street between 17th and 18th Streets. Um, it is run by a collective called the Clarion Alley Mural Project, but Pretty much throughout this entire thoroughfare on both sides of this small alleyway are, good Lord, at least maybe about four different dozen murals by a, an amazing diverse plethora of artists and artistic kind of backgrounds, ones that have been formally trained through MFA programs to ones that have been self-taught. Talking about, you know, very real issues such as, you know, colonization and homelessness to much more abstract things that really just are hoping to, you know, just again, instill that little moment of joy. Yeah. I think people also miss that when a public art project is really successful, it also economically benefits the community. Like the community members not only have the reason to be excited of like their community looking nicer from the outside and having something to sort of um, bond upon, but like in the case where you said in the missions and the murals, um, there's a ton of people that when they come to San Francisco, just as uh, visitors, travelers, they want to go visit that place and they want to get a coffee when they visit that place. They want to get ice cream or they want to go eat They locally. want to go eat, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You also had this really cool drawing project of city landscapes, which you described on your website by saying, quote, seen from a distance, the view of a city is a site of promise, spectacle, and stimulation. From this perspective, it's a place that can feel so large and anonymous, yet can help materialize our sense of location, orientation, grounding, and belonging. What would you say this project taught you about the attractions humans have to urban environments? Well, how, how much have you traveled? I've traveled a good amount So, as a kid. You know, I think any time that you are able to get to, I mean, I, I wouldn't even say like a major metropolitan area, but most of the times when you go to visit a new city, um, a lot of times it really, you kind of want to get that perspective of what the city looks like from a, like a skyline perspective. You know, one of the reasons Twin Peaks here in San Francisco is so popular, both amongst tourists and sometimes locals too, is it's that one perspective from way on top of the hill that you can see the entire city laid out mm. beneath your feet, at least that side of the city, right? And it's that moment of like, it's that infinite moment of universal kind of just breath of pause of contemplation where you can see not only the scope of architecture below you, but just the imagination of how many different so stories and people and lives are happening within each one of those individual buildings and streets. You know, I think it's one of the fascinations that we all have when we take airplane flights, when we actually look out the window, when we're about to land into a new city, it's just seeing, you know, it's a humbling experience to be able to realize how small you are as one individual person versus kind of like the scope of, of, of humanity as displayed in some of these major metropolitan cities. It's kind of an ego check in some ways. And I think it's a really great ego check because no matter what kind of, um, what kind of drama or problems or situations that you have going on in your own life, if you can like take a moment to step back and just look at the, 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 the pure sheer quantity of life happening in front of you. That's what I love about, you know, about taking a look at cities from that perspective. That also comes from a really real place because I grew up in New Jersey outside of Manhattan, New York. So I always saw the specter of San Fran of, of New York city from the other side of the river. 
living out here in the Bay Area since 1994, I've never lived in San Francisco. I've always lived in the East Bay, in Berkeley, in Emeryville. I've been living in Oakland now for 20 some years. And so I always have that specter of San Francisco from driving across the bridge. Yeah. And it's always, you know, seeing the city from afar that provides that sense of, of like an ego check that provides that sense of pause, of contemplation, of like realizing that like, hey, maybe my particular situation and problems and drama isn't as big as it needs to be right now. Yeah. A personal experience that comes up to me is uh, Guanajuato, Mexico. So it's the city of Guanajuato and the state of Guanajuato. And they have this huge statue called uh, Pipila, which is on top of a hill. And you sort of have to take this like motorized escalator to go all the way up to the top right. of the hill and visit it. And um, I remember me and my sister, we, we went there as kids a couple of times. And when you're up there, you have a huge view of the city. And it's really interesting because a big part of the architecture of that community is all the houses are painted super colorfully, pinks, um, beiges, blues, greens. So when you're up there, it looks just like a rainbow right. of just houses. And, um, you know, I had on an architectural theorist a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about the aesthetic experience in architecture. And I feel like that's one of those aesthetic experiences, so to speak, I've had in my life is just the grandiosity of that experience where you're just faced with just the whole city. But wouldn't you say that's like a universal experience in terms of the moment that you're up there, you feel both calm and excitement at the same time? Yeah. You know, calmness in terms of you're kind of being able to see it from that perspective. You're not like you're not in the midst of the hustle and bustle of street life. You're kind of like, you know, that proverbial 10,000 feet above it. You're, you're looking from a distance. And that moment of like pause and reflection and contemplation, I think it happens universally from people that are able to step outside of their, to talk about routines, step outside of their normal routines just for a little bit and get that distance perspective. I think it's a universal thing. In an essay for an exhibition catalog at Sac State, you explored this concept of gestaltism, saying, gestaltism predicts that we need to organize what we see in order to make sense of the world. Popularly understood as the whole is something, or quote, the whole is something else than the sum of its parts. Maybe for the people in the audience that aren't too familiar with gestaltism, I think it'd be great if you kind of give them an overview and a definition, and then maybe relate it oh, to like- just thought, just thought, uh -huh. Just thoughtism, okay, yeah, cool, yeah, yeah. got you. And yeah. then maybe what that difference is in the context of like curatorial work. Well, let's put it in context like this way. Uh, it's a, <laughs> for, it's a sports analogy. Uh, I'll take probably like the most popular, well, actually it can apply to a lot of different sports, but the most popular sport here in the United States, football, not soccer, but like American football. Um, you've got 11 players on each side of the football, 11 defense, 11 offense. The way that that entire unit moves and operates dictates who's actually going to be winning the game. Take any individual part, be it like a tackle, a linebacker, a running back. Those are just one piece of the cog to a larger unit that needs to operate in unison or collectively to be able to have success. And so, you know, as that relates, this sports analogy, as it relates to like the, the visual arts field, exhibitions can be comprised of individual pieces of artworks, but how they operate together as a holistic body is what kind of determines success for that exhibition. Each work in and of itself has its own story and its own narrative self-contained, but then what kind of like meta larger story can you actually tell by piecing all of these individual stories together? That's what I think I meant in that essay is, you know, is literally like sometimes the whole is greater than its, the sum is greater than its parts. You know, it's democracy in action. It takes all of us to basically make this society run and run well. And if we think about the glue that's gluing all of those pieces of artwork together in like the abstract sense, do you think like the curatorial statement is it's trying to describe the glue and kind of like bring that down to earth? It's definitely trying to describe it in a verbal sense. I think the curatorial practice tries to make sense of it in a visual sense as it's laid out in a physical space. Curatorial statements can definitely uh, convey and articulate the concept and the theory behind why these particular works are grouped together at this particular time. But then to see that theory put out into practice, into action, is the actual space of the, of the gallery or museum in this case, you know. 
I want to explore some of the insights you've kind of like personally arrived to in doing curatorial work. I'm sure a lot of these projects are kind of like uniquely great opportunities to kind of reflect on various aspects of both your own personal lived experience and kind of like the collective um, lived human experience. Do any maybe experiences stand out where you were working on a project and you kind of had a realization that maybe surprised you a bit? Um, not necessarily realizations that surprise me, but realizations that sometimes artists are the first communicators or sometimes the best communicators of really difficult things to talk about in life. Social inequities, racial inequities, uh, financial inequities, uh, trauma from violent situations. Sometimes artists are the best ones to be able to articulate this in ways that can be emotionally and intellectually understood at the same time. So nothing that really surprised me, but just almost further kind of reinforced my the belief in the power of what art can do. I think every single project has reinforced that idea. I wonder how similar that is to maybe the role political commentators can play in society at times. Aside from like the entertainment aspect of political, political commentary, I was thinking about this the other day, like we all don't have enough time to arrive at a well thought out opinion or political stance on every issue. So sometimes we like outsource uh, that like critical thinking work on various issues to political commentators we pre-vet and trust their opinion on. And from there we can kind of build maybe not a, a personalized outlook on the world, but an outlook that's we're estimating to be as accurate as we can arrive at. And then maybe in a sense, if artists are like, if we assume they're the greatest communicators among society, there may be ways in which art can serve as a plug and play form of communication for topics that we may not feel best equipped to communicate with others. I mean, I think they are all part of the same equation of how we as a society and we individually kind of come to form our opinions. There's no escaping the amount of media that we're subjected to and kind of forced to in some cases, but the access to as many different media sources that we have now in the 21st century is unparalleled at any point in time in history. You know, um, we're pretty much carrying an encyclopedia and access to all of these different streams of information and media right in our pocket. You know, even something like 50 years ago, you'd have to like go to the corner store to pick up a newspaper to even like find out what opinions were out there, what kind of current events actually did happen. Um, but I think, you know, part of being human and part of being a critical thinker is just not necessarily absorbing, but, you know, taking all of this information and data and media out there and parsing out what actually rings true for you. And this is all a big mishmash of information that is contributed to by political commentators, contributed to by real journalists, contributed to by artists and musicians and writers and filmmakers. Um, it's all part of it's all part of this uh, this meta stream of information that it's it's I think it's up to every responsible individual and citizen to like, parse through that and find out what really kind of don't just take things at face value, but find out what things are actually kind of really resonating with you and like kind of dig into it more. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think every field has a core set of skill sets or, or skills or maybe sure. aptitudes. Right. And, you know, I have certain friends that aren't really into art, let's say music as an example. And to them, if they're listening to the radio, every song just kind of sounds like music. Sure. Whereas I would think about myself or just other friends that are really into music. It almost seems as though we're much more capable in identifying what we like about a song, what we don't like about a song, and maybe some, some themes that the song is exploring and yep. some messages the song's communicating. When you think about the skills that are most important to being a great curator, do you think that like aptitude to identify the messages um, being communicated through artwork is like one of the core skills that a curator kind of relies on for their role? It's definitely a foundational skill. It's definitely a foundational skill to not only be able to read the work with the lens of what the artist's intent might have been, but to also read the work 
um, to kind of uncover both conceptual and intellectual intents that the artist may not have even been aware of in the first place. I think that's a great analogy with music. You know, you can make that analogy with any kind of 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 form. You know, I kind of always bring this back to sneakers. I'm looking at your Nikes right now. Some people might just take any kind of sneakers as just a pair of shoes. It's a functional thing. It just protects your naked feet from actually touching the pavement. Yeah. But then you get into the other end of that spectrum where you have entire literal experts about who can identify the difference between like specific versions of Air Jordans, for example, and they can immediately tell by the stitching of a certain kind of Air Jordan, where it was manufactured, what year it was actually manufactured, all of this stuff. I think um, that is an interesting point of conversation about, you know, where is that middle ground between being an amateur and being like an expert in something, you know? Um, I think that kind of gray area is where you potentially can 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 obtain like the most amount of interest in um, becoming a specialty in any one of these fields. You know, like your friends that may not know music at all, but like might like the groove of certain things, and that's like kind of that gray area between them being like maybe like an amateur music lover to you and your friends being like expert music lovers. It's a, it's a really interesting thing to to think about, like how you can introduce at least that platform of like, hey, if you're kind of liking this stuff, maybe we can show you some other examples where you yourself might want to become an expert in in this particular field. I know yeah. this is probably going off topic right now, but no, no, yeah, and I think like recognizing patterns is so important because I think there's examples of a ton of topics that we all don't find very interesting like there's certain sports let's say cricket for example right like i've never really watched cricket and if there's you know a cricket game on a tv and i'm looking at it it just kind of seems like a stick hitting a ball sure. doesn't seem very i'm not engaged in it sure. doesn't seem very interesting but if i had someone that's very passionate about it kind of like outlining oh no no what you're actually watching right now is a person having to throw the ball right here and that's so hard because x y and z and the other person is kind of adjusting their body to throw them off and that's difficult because of x y and z you start appreciating it a lot more and it maybe takes that kind of like spark of a person kind of like introducing you a framework to to kind of like perceive what's actually occurring. Well, I mean, this is the level. whole purpose of your podcast, right? It's to create an atlas of all of these introductory points to be able to introduce people to the passions of all of these different fields. You're going to have a better appreciation for something if you understand that thing, right? Yeah, I don't have an appreciation for cricket because I actually don't understand the rules of the game. If somebody were to actually sit down with me to explain it and to show me the passion that they have watching a game on TV, I would probably get into it too. Yeah. Um, but that's, I think, especially working in the arts and media, um, I think that's you know the biggest kind of challenge for us is how do we introduce new audiences at least to this introductory level of moving them past this gray area into something that is more akin to wanting to learn more to become like less of a gray area person and more of like an appreciator or more of an expert about something. Um, that's always the case with, with all of these things, be it literature, be it sports, be it music, be it fashion, be it even um, podcast and media production, right? Yeah. And I think sometimes for certain pieces of art, the intentions with which the art was created are made very clear either by the creator or by just how obvious the design uh, of the artwork makes it. But other times there's artists that make, let's say a song or a painting, and they're very set on not explaining it at all and leaving it up to interpretation. Where does that kind of fit in to the responsibility curators have, let's say, to interpreting kind of the message being communicated in artwork and then have it fit with the other pieces of artwork and a curatorial work and, and making it cohesive. Like w what is that interpreting pieces of artwork where the interpretation is, is a lot more challenging than those where the- Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a great question. I think it's, a, it's, always, um, it's always a fine line of where on the grayscale or where on the spectrum you actually kind of want to land. As curators, you don't want to over curate a show and you don't want to over analyze and over be didactic about how somebody should look at a piece of work and interpret it. You want to be able to have that um, that kind of infinite 
possibility of emotional experience, of intellectual experience, of just reaction to a piece of work. You don't necessarily know what somebody is bringing to the table when they're actually looking at a piece of artwork. If something is talking about something incredibly traumatic, let's say it's a piece of artwork that's really dealing with the trauma of war. You don't know necessarily if somebody is a veteran. You don't necessarily know if somebody actually had to escape a country because of military conflict. We are living in the 21st century where unfortunately so much of the diaspora around the, the world has been caused by conflict, by war. And so, you know, having something that is talking about, for example, uh, the Vietnam slash American war in the 1960s might have such a much more powerful impact on somebody that has just returned from a tour of duty in the Middle East, serving as part of the uh, U.S. Army, for example, versus somebody who's never done military time at all. So I think you um, need to trust the experience that viewers will have with the work and kind of trust that whatever that they're going to bring to the table is valuable and will have their own crafting of an avenue in which to really look at and understand that work. Part of the job of a curator too is to provide a little bit of contextualized information to, to make the unknown kind of more known or to make the kind of not so visible a little bit more visible to, to viewers. And so it's a, it's a really, it's a fine balancing trick of wanting to explain something which could give somebody a little bit more insight into a piece of work without being overly like um, overly like didactic about how to read a work. You want to give them insight into like potentially, hey, these are ways that you might want to look at the work that you may not have been aware of. You don't want to tell them this is how you have to look at it, but here are some opportunities of ways that you should look at it. Now, if an artist leaves one individual piece of theirs up to interpretation, that's one thing. Is there precedence? Um, for curatorial, curatorial work where the curator leaves the organization and the selection of the pieces of artwork up to interpretation as well? Oh, yeah. There's been, there's been th yeah, so many different projects throughout uh, art history. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any standout come to mind in that respect? Uh, not off the top of my head. I mean, there are some exhibitions. So there's like two, there's two schools of thoughts about, um, I mean, sitting here in this conference room in the business building, uh, just looking at this this framed photograph of of the Bay Bridge and the skyline of San Francisco pre Salesforce Tower, you have to know. Yeah, there's no Salesforce Tower there, but you know, there's no there's no information around that image. There's we don't have who the name of the photographer was. I'm assuming it's photography. We don't have a, an idea of what year it was taken, although we could probably deduct that because Salesforce Tower is not in that picture. But, you know, it's, we don't know what kind of uh, atmospheric conditions created this beautiful sunset. That kind of orange is a different sensibility now post 2020 when we all experienced that crazy day when the skies turned orange for the day because of all the smoke particulate in the air. So all of this information is kind of by conjecture. And that's kind of beautiful that I can look at this image and just like think and wonder like, oh, you know, what was the context behind the person actually taking this photograph? There's another school of thought that says that all of that information should be clearly visible and right next to the artwork with maybe even some kind of explanatory text to it that the photographer literally sat on top of Yerba Buena Island for three hours during such and such a day. Maybe this was, maybe this was the summer solstice. Yeah. Who knows what it might have been? Maybe this was like a, a the residue of a of a, a of a tropical storm that impacted Hawaii really badly, and that's why it's all of the the high cloud covers. But, you know, would that be interesting information to know about that piece? Let's say this was the residue of a particular tropical storm that actually had really damaging impacts on Hawaii that grabbed, that continued move eastward till it hit California. So it's the same kind of moisture band. It's the same clouds that actually caused devastation in, in Hawaii. Like, you know, yeah. 
that kind of information would be leading you to look at this photograph like a little bit differently. So it's this push and pull and it's trying to find that middle ground, you know? I guess the context of the curatorial work matters as well, because if you're, let's say, in an educational context at a planetarium where right. uh, elementary school kids are constantly right. going to visit, right. you definitely want to have a description there. Whereas if the curatorial work is more maybe experience focused, where you just kind of want to give the yeah. viewers a, an ex or, visual experience. Or a contemporary art museum versus like a natural history museum. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Exhibitions, you can have that. They are that widely defined. It's defined as like seeing that like little diorama of like the saber toothed tiger in a natural history museum, all the way to like a contemporary art museum like the SF MoMA, where you're seeing like these really beautiful abstract expressionist paintings. Yeah. They're all exhibitions. You to make? Yeah, and I think we've talked a lot about the curatorial process and not a lot about the actual like gallery spaces. How do you sort of anticipate the presentation and consumption of art to change in the future? Is there any? Big trends right now in the museum and gallery spaces that oh it's already changed since it's already changed since the advent of 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 well the advent and growth of of portable media and especially social media and mm -hmm. especially phones so many people are consuming art strictly through digital imagery so many people know so many pieces of art but they've never seen it in real person. How many people around the world can actually say that they know what the Mona Lisa looks like? Probably one of the most famous paintings in the world. Probably if you were walk down the street, you could probably get at least five out of 10 people to say that they know what the Mona Lisa looks like. Yeah. But five out of those 10 people may have never even seen it in person. It's the prolif proliferation of like digital media. I think art is primarily consumed through the screen these days. Is that a good thing? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think it's a good thing if it can create awareness of certain artists, if it can actually create enough kind of interest to be able to to go and see that actual piece in person. I try never to curate work without actually seeing the work with my own naked eyes mm. uh, because the screen is a really valuable tool, but it'd be a really deceitful tool too. What do you think you get out of seeing it in person versus oh, seeing it Oh, everything. You get the texture, you get the depth, you get the vibrancy of the colors. You get to see it with like your naked eyes. There's nothing separating you and that piece of work except just blank air. There's yeah. not the surface of a glass screen. There's not the distance between. You get to see what it's like in real size versus like what's actually like a 10 foot by 10 foot painting on mm -hmm. this thing is like two inches by two inches. Do you think that's a technological problem or do you think that's that goes to just the difference between being with something in reality or virtually? Because maybe if you think about the context of like virtual reality and augmented reality products, there might be ways in which that like barrier to gauging the like texture and uh, three dimensionality of a piece is becoming less and less now that you can put on a headset and actually like move around and see it. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're slowly on that path to getting there. Don't you find it interesting that when Zuckerberg rebranded Facebook and Instagram to meta and was basically putting all chips in for the metaverse, mm -hmm. how many folks do you know that are actually actively part of the metaverse now? Yeah, I don't know much that have the headset. I think it's also like an economic constraint because like the Apple Vision Pro, for example, I think it costs like 3000 3000 and people like really have fun with it for a day or two. And then mm -hmm. just like, they're like, this is actually a really expensive piece of coffee table yeah. technology. Have you tried it? I have not tried it yet. I've definitely put on VR goggles. I put on the Oculus, um, definitely. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't necessarily, I, again, we're on the path to potentially an entire societal kind of shift. I don't think we're there yet. This is the baby steps. This is like basically, this is the internet when like AOL is still around. Yeah. Yeah. I tried the demo um, at Stonestown. And I think there were at certain points where they, they were showing kind of like a video and the resolution was a little off and it just felt obvious that I was wearing kind of like a gimmicky piece of technology. Yeah. But there was another sort of like surround video they played where Alicia Keys was like right in front of me. 
and like the resolution was like 8K on each lens and it really felt like, whoa, like she's actually in front of me. It was a pretty crazy experience. How was the sound? The sound wasn't great. No, the sound, that, yeah, that was one of the, the kind of like low points, I guess, of the demo was the sound wasn't that loud. But I don't know if that's, you know, due to you being in the store, you hear people around. True, but again, like this is like, imagine this technology in 10, 20 years. Yeah, that's what I was going to get to. Like if we think about the, the rate in which technology sort of accelerates, we might get to a point 10, 15 years from now where the difference between experiencing a painting in person or virtually might be approaching the uncanny valley more and more. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're already in the uncanny valley, but I think in 10 or 20 years, that notion of the uncanny valley is actually going to be um, less and less. You know, because the uncanny valley means like you kind of know that something is like a representation of reality, but there's something slightly off that you yeah. know that it's not reality. Yeah. So, I think all those like AI uh, movies like Ex Machina, like that's exactly what it gets to. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Like we, you kind of believe it for a second, but there's something that throws you off where you realize that it's not quote unquote real life or reality. That that distance is going to slowly start to like shrink Yeah, where literally in 10 or 20 years, we're going to be at that point where that kind of virtual reality will be so seamless and actually indistinguishable potentially from real reality. I don't know what society is going to be like at that point, you know? Yeah. Although I do think that that innate ability for human beings to have a certain kind of intuition as to whether something is real or fake. It's actually very impressive. I've had experiences where like I'm talking to customer support and they kind of like present it as if you're actually talking to another person, but it is a chat bot. Right. And I've, I'll kind of notice like, oh, that word I've never like, my brain's so good at picking up certain kind of words that are a little sketchy and then putting them together. Be like, oh no, I don't think I'm actually talking to a person. And it kind of made me think like, oh wow, that's a very, I felt very capable in that moment of, of filtering out. Yeah, filtering what, out. Yeah. And like recognizing sort of how I felt innately about this kind of being a sketchy interaction. And that does seem like a really difficult kind of line to cross technologically to get to the point where a person can't really distinguish one from the other. Well, I don't know. Is this human nature? Will we actually have that kind of reaction once we realize that what we're actually interacting with isn't a uh, human? Is there an innate thing in our human nature to actually want to have like real connection like this? Yeah. And then is it something about human nature or is it something about how well socialized the person is? Because oh. if a person grew up and wasn't very well socialized, is that actually kind of robbing them of the opportunity to develop that, that kind of radar? That's true. And we still haven't seen all of the residual impacts of the COVID years kind of come into play yet. Yeah. So many young people... Um, especially young people uh, who are in their developmental phase, you know, having to be shut down for two plus years because of, of, of COVID, where basically you couldn't socialize, uh, you were basically stuck at home. Imagine those formative years when you're like in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, even yeah. like a teenager. Yeah, I think the effects we're probably going to be more dramatic on, on younger kids, elementary school, middle school, you mentioned, but I'm curious if you've kind of like observed maybe a little bit of those effects in your students now that missed out on a lot of formative years in high school. Uh, I maybe wouldn't have a direct correlation to the COVID years, but I think it's just much more of a societal uh, acceptance and, uh, understanding and also uh, empathy about mental health issues. People are much more forthcoming about talking about how they're doing. Um, I have, and I'm glad that they do, I have m more frequently have had students get in touch with me to say that they apologize for not making um, attendance for class because they just are not they need to take care of themselves that day. Yeah. And because they were responsible enough to get in communication with me, I am very understanding. And like, I give them 
as much space and support as I'm able to give them. I think, you know, this has been a fundamental shift in recent years uh, versus when I was in my 20s. The, 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 uh, the, the openness to talk about uh, mental health struggles and just mental health in general is, is a different thing. I think it's much more accepted now. I think it's much more understood. Um, and hopefully, in a larger societal way, I hope it's a lot more, again, people empathize with uh, folks that are having mental health struggles. Yeah. That, you know, you can acknowledge that somebody is going through it and try to provide as much support and help as as you are able to provide. But at least the acknowledgement and the, the support systems, you know, that the, the acknowledgement that what somebody's going through is, is a real thing. Yeah. To sort of round out our conversation, I want to ask you um, a question that relates to sort of to how you feel about your work. And hopefully it's not too abstract, but I wonder if you thought about like what part of yourself you think is most reflected in your work. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, probably the most probably the calmer, more introspective, more meditative part of me. Because my my work as a curator and my work as an educator, it's a very social front-facing kind of way to exist in the world. I'm a fairly social person uh, in my personal life. Um, but in my own work, that's a moment for me to kind of just like calm, quiet down stuff, like to basically center myself inside myself. Most of my other work is kind of outward facing and also uh, my attention is outward facing. I'm really interested in supporting students to be the best students that they can be. I'm interested in supporting artists to give them as much supportive exposure and opportunities um, as possible in my, in my capacity. So it's all about, you know, looking outward and finding ways to elevate and support and advocate for, for both students and artists in these capacities I have. My own personal artwork is a moment for me to kind of come back into myself. So I think that's the most important thing. And for your own personal work, I think it was Rick Rubin I heard talk about, it was actually Naval talk about how work is meditative if you forget about yourself while you're working on it. Yeah. And I heard you mention and use the word introspective when you work on your personal work. Do you, it, it, how, how do you sort of like reconcile maybe the, the meditative um, kind of component of personal work with also introspecting and being aware of oneself while working on it? Do you think it's like introspective and meditative at the same time? Is it the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's like the, the part of the meditating is like forgetting about yourself, but introspecting is like exploring yourself. But you can explore yourself to the degree where you don't have to explore yourself anymore, if that makes sense. Interesting. So you're just kind of going off of like your innate understanding about yourself? Like you've kind of already explored well, it. Yeah, maybe this is maybe this is some great part of your overall podcast series, Atlas, here, that you're talking to all of these um, all of these individuals that have worked in their particular field for several years, if not decades. And I think you know maybe this is a great note to end our conversation on too. That um, I definitely have decades up on you, Juan, mm -hmm. and like you know I think I've come to that terms of finding areas within myself that I'm at peace with. Mm. Part of growing up is finding areas that you just are not at peace with. And that causes sometimes the beautiful fire inside of you to become the person that you want to be. Like you want to achieve your goals. You want to achieve your dreams. Like sometimes it's career focus. Sometimes it's internally focused. Like I want to become like the fastest person or I want to become like the strongest person. Um, so I'm, you know, through year decades of living, I think I've gotten to that point where parts of me, like, I, if I I'm at peace with myself, so I don't have to like have that sense of introspection anymore because I've already done all of that work over decades. Yeah, that's interesting hearing you describe it because it sounds so so novel to me, you know. And it should be for somebody in their twenties. Yeah, yeah, it should all be about the questioning. It should be about the experimentation. It should be about the failure. 
and like learning from those failed opportunities. Like you need to fail when you're young to really realize exactly what you want to pursue as you're getting older, you know? Yeah. And I have a closing question I typically ask every guest, but I have a different idea to end our okay. conversation on it. If we think about everyone's personal introspection journey, what tools would you kind of provide to the younger people listening and yeah. navigating that journey of introspecting themselves? Uh, number one, first and foremost, the media detox. To find a way to just put away the technology, even for an hour or two or half a day, sometimes with your best friend, with your partner, with your sibling, sometimes it's life changing in this day and age in 2024 to go out for a walk to the beach without your cell phone in your pocket. You can't immediately just check something. And I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. Everyone's guilty of it in the 21st century. That Just that natural motion now of just pulling out the phone, checking something. What? I don't know. Checking like who messaged you. Checking like, hey, like what's for dinner tonight? Like checking what the weather's going to be like. Everything is like available to you now. And I think that that is a easy way to just pull yourself out of the moment and from really taking into full, like literally with your entire body, like where you're at and the, the environment that you're at at that particular moment. You can't really be with anything but yourself if you don't have anything else with you. So yeah, if, 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 if you're able to put away the phone for like an hour and just go for a walk without having a cell phone with you, Sometimes it could be life changing. Sometimes you'd be like, I've never noticed that house on the corner, yeah. for example. Or like, hey, I never noticed like this is the way that I actually walk. Because also, you know, I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes like when we're walking from point A to point B, sometimes we develop this little hunch because we're actually like leaning into our phones. So what is it about like even just being body aware? Like what's the posture of how you're walking? And the pace that you're walking, I'm like, hey, do you realize that you're actually taking your strides like this amount of distance? Mm -hmm. It's just like a, it's like a reshift. It's like a refocus. It's like hopefully a different type of world. I guess maybe a thing, uh, a way to think about it as well is like the people we spend the most amount of days slash time with are the people we're most familiar with. And if we think about days in which we distract ourselves um, during every moment that's like a day we didn't connect with ourselves more. And if you stack those days on top of days on top of days, it may be months, weeks, years before you actually spend a day with yourself. Yeah. Maybe develop that relationship. Well, what was the question that you usually ask everybody? Um, question I usually ask is, if you were 20 years old at this current moment, what fields would you study? What problems would you aim to solve? Oh, really? Can answer that one too, if you like. If I was 20 years old, what fields would I, what would I major in here? Yeah, like what fields would you study, whether it be in college or just sort of extracurricularly, and then maybe what problems would you solve, which kind of centers more around um, guests I asked in Silicon Valley, like what yeah. what startup would you start now if you were younger? You know? Right. I mean, honestly, uh, if I was younger, I probably would somehow be involved within the world of, of medicine and healthcare. I think um, here in the United States, we just have a very strange system where, medic where, where healthcare is not available to all. And it's just such a travesty when you think about like if you actually have like a pretty bad health problem that it actually might run you into bankruptcy. That's kind of criminal in my opinion. Like you could yeah. go to other – my brother lives up in Canada now and they have socialized health care for all. To think about like you're not going to go to the doctor because you're, you've are you got this pain in your foot because you're scared of paying like a bill for it yeah. and you're going to suffer for it, that's like – that's just not right. So – if I was 20 in some capacity, maybe not becoming like a doctor doctor, but maybe it's like learning about the the business administration of, of, of medical health centers, but finding a way to be able to slowly shift the tide and turn the dial where this kind of care and this kind of access to care can become more accessible to more people. And it's not necessarily based on if you have a full-time job or not based on the socioeconomic status of your family. 
Like, you know, everyone should have the best ability to be the best person that they can be. Sometimes health problems are stuff that can be easily fixed through modern medicine. But if you don't have access to that, then you're not living a good life. And sometimes you're living a really painful life. Do you think you both recognize the importance of that problem and are interested in it or just recognize the importance of that problem? Because hearing you answer that, it was making me think like maybe an optimal path for people to take from a career perspective is to find a problem that they feel an emotional connection with, but that they're also interested in. Because then those two things I work mean, in tandem. I mean, that's a sweet spot. Yeah. That's a sweet spot. You don't want to have, you don't want to dedicate years of starting to study a career path if you're not passionate about that. Mm-hmm. If you're only doing it because A, you think that that kind of career would be a, uh, some kind of uh, respectable career to have, or B, which is the reason that most people enter certain fields um, without being passionate about it, is because you think you're going to be making big money, <laughs> but you're not passionate about it. That's going to be that's going to come and bite you in the long run. Yeah. You're going to maybe be like a millionaire, but you're going to be miserable about having spent like 15 years of your life not actually enjoying the work that you've been doing. Yeah, it's that sweet spot. And I think if at 20 years old. Uh, is that how old you are? Yeah. Oh, you are 20. Mm-hmm. Really? I turn 21 next month, though. So You're way wiser than me on your age, man. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Seriously. Appreciate but it. at your age, like, yeah, it's like having that opportunity to try and fail. Mm-hmm. Like, if you think you're interested in this thing, for you to have that window of, I mean, this is me talking to you now, mm-hmm. a window of just, like, acceptance and just, like, not beating yourself up over the head if you spend three years following something and you come to that realization that's like, man, I actually don't really like doing this stuff at all. Yeah. But to have that open window going like, hey, accept that and know that it's not a failure of three years of life. It's just like, you know, and you've been down this path and you know now. You wouldn't have known that if you didn't do those three years. Yeah. But I think at this point being 20, like you would got to try a bunch of different stuff um, to and maybe you're one of the lucky few, especially in terms of media production, which it seems like it is your sweet spot, like to know like what you want to spend your time actually investing in yourself doing and what you actually like doing. Sometimes people know that and like, you know, God bless them that they, they it's a perfect match. Sometimes it takes other people like years to figure out. Yeah. And I think you touched on, you know, like salary and expected outcome people have when choosing career paths. And... I have like a different hypothesis. And my hypothesis is that what actually matters much more is exploring topics energetically and with depth. And if you take that approach, it makes it so that you never have to consider what the traditional expected salary or outcome of going into X, Y, or Z field is. Because if you explore topics with depth, you can make yourself valuable in every single market there is. Ideally, yeah. And people make the mistake of saying, oh, I'm going to go into this set career path to get this salary. Um, not realizing that like you still have to be great in that market, you know? And like what actually matters is competence rather than like Well, competence decision. matters, yeah, period. Competence matters for sure. Yeah. But it's also a matter of where your, your own personal uh, philosophies about money stand. How you grew up. Did you grow up poor? Did you grow up middle class? Did you grow up rich? You know? And also I think every every parent would want this for their kids. And you might want the same if you have kids one day yourself. Like you just want your children to be happy with what they're doing and to be self sufficient. You want them to be able to support themselves, you know? Yeah. Um so yeah, I mean let's not let's not sugarcoat it though. We are living in one of the most expensive regions in the country, the Bay Area. So sometimes the struggle just to exist, meaning just to have a roof over your head and to have food in your belly, sometimes like that number, man, like sometimes you do have to just hustle and sometimes you have to do work that you don't really want to do just so you could actually pay the rent and pay and have money to buy groceries. Yeah. I mean, let's not be, let's not be like, let's not be fake about that. That's like a real struggle for many people. Yeah. Um, But yeah, competence is absolutely the key factor. And, you know, I I kind of am of of that philosophy that if you've got your ducks in a row and you know that uh, you're doing the best that you can 
uh, and even more so, uh, and you're a genuine person, that, you know, hopefully you've crossed that part of that equation. I have this weird thing that I tell my students that opportunity is a math equation. Opportunity equals luck plus preparedness. Mm -hmm. You could be prepared, and that's all you have agency over. The luck part, you have no agency over whatsoever. You don't know who you're going to meet who might have that like perfect paid internship position for a dream job that you might want, but you could be prepared with having like your resume and like your talking points and all of the things that you have control over, like ready to go once that luck opportunity comes your way, you know? Yeah. And then maybe we can think about luck as being directly correlated with how successful you are and that should adjust your expectations. Meaning you need a ton of luck in order to become crazy successful like the huge celebrities or billionaires that we're all familiar with. But you actually don't need that much luck to build the kind of life that would be satisfying and fulfilling for yourself. And maybe that should be a cause for optimism and how we communicate that kind of equation. Yeah, and as a young person too, it's like you should, you'll slowly start to understand for yourself how you are going to define that for yourself. What is, what is a, a good life for me? Yeah. Not necessarily what a good life is defined in society, but like, what's a good life for me, you know? Like, yeah. no, I don't need to have those $500 pairs of kicks, you know? Goes back to introspection, like you said. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for being on. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, likewise. And thanks for the, uh, the patience with doing this in a two-part oh, section. All good. All right. Thank you, Juan.